All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Daniel. I work at Facebook as a production engineer. Uh, I work on a team called Kernel Applications, and the charter of our team is pretty much to make the Linux kernel more usable. Uh, and that typically means sitting on the user space side, but uh, using pretty new features. Uh, so this talk is about UMD, which stands for Out of Memory uh, Daemon. Uh, and so UMD is user space. Uh, it's runtime dependency free, so you don't need stuff like uh, systemd or anything to be running. Uh, I claim that it's deterministic, faster, and more flexible than the kernel UM killer, and I'll talk more about that in the later slides. UMD is also open sourced. Uh, I put it under GPL2, and there's the GitHub link there. There's also uh, some documentation that a guy named uh, Thomas wrote. You should check that out if, you, uh, if you're interested. So the uh, agenda for this talk is uh, I'm going to go over the motivation, the mechanisms, uh, and then the results behind UMD. Uh, and then I'll leave some time at the end for questions or discussion if anyone's interested. Uh, this talk is going to be a bit, little bit short, so it's short and sweet, so you're going to get some of your day back. So motivation, so why create UMD? Uh, so I think it's what we back up and talk about uh, out of memory conditions. Uh, I'm going to assume most of you in this room know what memory overcommit is, so I'm not going to really go into that. Uh, the short version is malloc really usually doesn't return a uh, null pointer. Uh, but sometimes when you try to access the memory, your machine's going to run uh, oom because you have no more physical memory left. And so what happens after that? Well, configuring what happens during an oom is actually somewhat complicated and not very intuitive. Uh, there's a bunch of these knobs I listed there uh, under proc. Uh, there's like oom score, oom score just, whatever. And some of these numbers go from like negative 16 to positive 15 or something, and then some of them start at zero and go to positive 1,000. Uh, if you sit down and actually re read oomkill.c, the numbers actually make so, sort of make sense, and I would understand why they're there. But I think from a user perspective, like user-facing perspective, it's not exact. It, it's not the most easy thing to use, at least in my opinion. Another problem with the kernel oomkiller is that the kernel oomkiller is actually pretty slow to act. So by the time it kicks in, it's already usually too late for the workload. The workload could have been live locked or just locked up or whatever, just stalled for any period of time. Uh, and the reason behind that is because the kernel killer tries to protect the kernel health. It doesn't really concern itself with uh, user space too much. So for example, if the kernel thinks uh, the system is making forward progress, uh, be it just churning pages in and out of the page cache, then it's going to keep just, it's going to think like, all right, sure, that's fine. We're going to just keep going. Uh, but user space could have been live locked for like up to minutes already. And we see that a lot of the times. Like the workload usually stops responding to heartbeats for a good period of time. And then the kernel killer kicks in and then kind of screws up the rest of the system. Uh, the kernel killer doesn't really have any good context on the logical composition of a system either. So maybe there's two processes that should never be killed together. Maybe there's two of them where only one of them should ever be killed and the other should be alive or something like that. Or you can also imagine more complicated scenarios. Uh, and there's no great way to customize that either. So there's an event FT you can use, but it's still slow for the reasons I mentioned in the previous uh, slide. Uh, as far as customization goes, for some processes, a sig kill or sig, sig term is just fine. But for others, you might want to song and dance. Uh, and so the example I always use is a, a container management daemon. So for example, Docker D or something. So if the system runs out of memory, you don't want to kill the management daemon. You actually want to kill the workloads that are running underneath it. Because if you kill the uh, management daemon, then these workloads are going to start doing uh, crazy things, potentially, and just not be managed. And that's kind of a bad situation. And it's somewhat hard to express using the uh, proc knobs that I showed before. It's also kind of non-deterministic, or at least it's really hard to get deterministic. So you can envision uh, multiple workloads or more than a workload of one, more than one process. And it's a, if you start out with new processes, it's kind of hard to turn the knobs in time to get it uh, just right to do exactly what you want. So Facebook actually suffers from a, a good deal of out-of-memory issues. Uh, so I listed uh, a couple of the biggest offenders here, and I'll go through them kind of briefly. So the first is the continuous build and test platform. Uh, it's called Sandcastle. Uh, so pretty much any time a Facebook developer checks in some code to, the, uh, to be reviewed, uh, a build is fired off, so it builds the program or whatever, and then it runs the continuous tests or something like that. Building and linking tends to take a lot of memory. Uh, so yeah, it takes a lot of memory to do that. And we also tend to build it in memory, because if you build a disk, you're going to wear out the disk really, really fast. These build and test jobs are also usually stacked on a single box, so you typically have between three and five on a single box, or whatever number it is these days. Uh, so it's pretty easy to actually oom these boxes. So oomd comes in and can actually help a lot with this. Uh, the other, as I mentioned before, is our container and service platform, which is called Tupperware. 
uh, developers Facebook can run services and jobs and whatever they want in this uh, platform. And these jobs are typically co-located with other jobs. And most of the time this is fine, but for some cases you can run out of memories in the box. For example, when you check in a memory leak or a memory bomb or just workloads that are unfortunately stacked with another one that take up too much memory. And so that's pretty bad. Uh, we also have an interesting uh, place where we run out of memory a lot, which is top of rack switches. So at Facebook, we have commodity top of rack switches, and it's called FBOSS. Uh, and it runs a full OS on top of that. And this is actually a pretty resource-constrained environment because, this, because it's like so commodity or whatever. It's, uh, it only has four gigs of RAM, so it's not a lot. So if you're serving a lot of traffic, and then somehow you're fetching a package at the same time, you can actually oom the box, which is really unfortunate because taking on a rack switch is like you're going to lose the entire rack uh, and potentially kill a lot of things that depend on the network. Uh, in general, the theme is any multi-tenant platform where you can have custom code running is uh, poten potentially subject to out-of-memory issues. So a lot of these tier owners, they actually tend to turn on panic on OOM because, uh, because it's like so hard to get the configuration right rather than let a system limp along and it's a semi-degraded state where you don't know what's alive and what's not, it's better to actually have the box reboot because when it comes up, you actually know everything you want to run is running. Uh, it's not optimal, it's an engineering trade-off, right? Uh, because now you have all these boxes that take like 15, 30 minutes to reboot in the data center and just not doing anything besides rebooting. Uh, and so you're losing a lot of resources there. UMD also is a part of FV tax too. And to back up a little bit, F the FV tax is the tax that every server at Facebook pays just to exist. You gotta run these like logging and health check and whatever demons. And so the tax you pay is like whatever resources these widely distributed binaries need. Uh, and the idea behind FP Tax 2 is you want to isolate the workload from this kind of interference. So if someone checks in uh, some code that leaks memory in these auxiliary applications, you don't want your workload to suffer as a result. And so this is Tajin's thing at Facebook uh, currently, and uh, people, Joseph has also helped out. Neither of them are here to, uh, this week, but uh, their talk is recorded online at other conferences, and you should check it out if you're interested. There's a bunch of links to all the relevant stuff, to uh, some of the relevant stuff to uh, FP Tax 2. So mechanism, so how does UMD actually work? So the main thing UMD uses is PSI, which is a, stands for pressure stall information, which is a relatively new kernel feature done by uh, Facebook's Johannes. There was a talk earlier today about uh, using PSI in Android. That was pretty cool. I was actually talking to Johannes earlier, saying I needed an event, or a notification interface for uh, PSI, which is, it's great to see that work is being done because it's better than Pauling. Uh, so at the core of UMD is also the plugin system. So all detection and uh, action behaviors are customizable. Uh, this is typically done via writing some C++ code or configuring stuff using a JSON config file that I'll show a little later. Uh, the end goal is so you, no one has to write any code. All you have to do is write some configuration stuff, uh, very lightweight configuration stuff. Uh, I provide a default UM detect and UM killer, and it's actually pretty sensible and it works pretty well across a variety of workloads. We tend to be able to run UMD in the stock configuration across uh, some uh, platforms. UMD doesn't actually, or it doesn't only uh, monitor memory pressure. We also get uh, I.O. pressure for free because of PSI. PSI supports uh, monitoring I.O. pressure. We also monitor swap depletion because swap, when a system runs out of swap, weird things can happen. For example, memory.low semantics. Uh, in the context of uh, C groups, uh, C group two, you can't really guarantee that from the kernel. So when you run out of swap, patholo pretty pathological things can happen. So we monitor that. In general, UMD exists to remediate things when kernel resource isolation isn't enough, which actually happens to be a pretty big problem. So this is the original UMD config. Uh, it's a JSON blob, and this is pretty much what a lot of tiers run with in uh, production. Uh, so what it says here is you're monitoring system.slice, and the dot .slice thing is uh, just the systemd-ism. It, it could be anything, really. Uh, and then you have a kill list, and so what this is saying is if machine runs out of memory, if, and if chef is using more than a gig of memory, uh, please kill chef first. Uh, and then it also says uh, sshd is being blacklisted because you don't really want to lose ssh access to a box. And then it says using the default oom killer and default oom detector. Uh, pretty straightforward stuff. So UMD as exists, like as the config I just showed, it works pretty well. Uh, it runs on a lot of hosts at Facebook and it does a lot of good things. But as we've onboarded more users and found more use cases and uh, just added more features in general, uh, it's become apparent you need, a, uh, you need kind of a redesign because as you know, software development goes, after you slap on enough features, you realize you gotta like redesign things a little bit, otherwise it's gonna collapse under its own weight. Uh, I'm still iterating pretty quickly and playing around the details. Uh, we've 
essentially we've established that this is a useful problem to be solved here. Uh, right now, it's mostly just an interface problem. Uh, in general, we're onto something, yeah, pretty useful. Uh, internally, we've dubbed it UMD2, which is a much more flexible version of UMD uh, as we come across these new requirements. I put up a giant patch on GitHub so like people know that it's happening, and I'm just not going to blow over the code after they've studied it. I'm not sure if anyone's actually studying the code, but it's there if anyone's curious. So this is the UMD2 config. Uh, it looks pretty similar. It's somewhat different. It's, uh, this is still JSON, but uh, interesting side note from the implementation, I created an intermediate representation. So it would take really like a couple hours to write a front end to parse the config and then generate the uh, intermediate representation, which can be compiled back into the data structures. Uh, in theory, you could have like a very compact IP tables-like syntax to do this kind of stuff, which is kind of what I designed this config around. Uh, what's circled in yellow is pseudocode, so it's not actually uh, the, the stuff you would type in. Uh, I'm going to skip forward. You can see like this is actually what it expands to. I'm not going to leave it up. There's really no point in squinting at it because you're going to realize it says the same thing as this. Uh, so what this is saying is if your workload slows down by more than 5% due to resource shortages, or if the auxiliary services slow down by more than 40%, uh, please kill a memory hog in the auxiliary services uh, C group. Uh, and so. This is a very basic example. You, you tend to want to chain these together in orthogonal fashions to create like a very robust uh, detection framework. Uh, and yeah, it works sort of like IP tables. You chain a bunch of rules and actions together. Uh, so development status. So yeah, I mentioned earlier, still iterating pretty quickly. Uh, if anyone wants to see any use cases uh, supported, yeah, please just send me an email or something. I'm happy to accommodate that. Uh, configure interface really isn't considered too stable yet. Uh, still working on it, but uh, mostly have the idea down. I have like some sort of like crappy BNF thing I wrote. Uh, if you have any interest in using it, please send me an issue or send me an email or anything like that. I'm happy to chat about whatever. So results. So how well does UMD uh, actually work? Uh, so this is a graph of memory usage over time on a build host. Uh, if you notice, there's no y-axis, and that's intentional. Uh, the lawyer said I couldn't have any numbers on the y-axis for reasons that'll be more apparent the next slide, but. I just had to take it out anyways. Uh, but you notice there, like around 11 AM, there's a sharp dip in memory usage after slowly growing over time. And that is because you know uh, UMD made a kill and kind of saved the box from looming. Uh, you imagine an 11 AM as some sort of build uh, job got kicked off. So this graph is the panic on UM rate before and, before and after an UMD rollout. So this is just for one region, for one uh, tier. So you can see there, there's a very sharp dip in uh, the panic on UM rate. Uh, and that's when the rollout happens. So you can see it's actually pretty immediately effective uh, what kind of panic on ooms it can prevent. Uh, if you also notice, there's, it doesn't drop to zero because um, we still need to tune UMD a little bit more. It doesn't work 100. It's not 100% foolproof, but it's, uh, it's a very nice benefit if you run it on your servers. Uh, yeah, that was it. If there's any questions, now's a good time. And do you do anything extra to make sure that UMD is responsive when the system is running out of memory? Uh, yeah, so we have run it under a slice called host critical that slice, which is kind of just an arbitrary. Can you repeat? Oh. Uh, go ahead. Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, the question is uh, are you doing anything specific to make sure that UMD is responsive when machine is running out of memory? Yeah, so we run UMD under a, a C group 2 slice called host critical, and it guarantees 64 megabytes of um, memory.min, which kind of essentially, it's kind of just M locks it into memory. Uh, although in the future, we could look at actually M locking it. Okay, uh, how do you guarantee the 64 max? Can, can you get closer to the mic? How do you guarantee 64 megabytes for OMD? Okay, how do you guarantee 64 megabytes for OMD? How do I guarantee that? Uh, I don't know, there's not really any hard guarantees. I've just observed it using less than 30 in general. And I'll bump it up if I need more. But it's, I wrote it in C++ and i just somewhat careful with memory, so it doesn't use too much to process text. Okay, and another question. What's uh, the improvement in OMD2 compared to OMD1? Sorry, was, there was a question, what's the difference between it? Yeah. 
Uh, the main difference is it supports more use cases. So for example, stuff like cross cgroup monitoring. Right now, UMD1 can only monitor one cgroup. Uh, for this, you can monitor an arbitrary number. Plus, the design of UMD1 is somewhat monolithic. It's just like, if you want to change something, you have to override a bunch of stuff, uh, which, isn't, which isn't too bad right now. But UMD2, everything is much more modular. So like, you can make code changes without like, accidentally breaking other stuff. So it's really um, an internal redesign. Functionality-wise, it should be the same or better. OK, thank you. Uh, I noticed um, early on you had a um, <coughs> A place where you're asking it not to kill open SSH. Um, have yeah. you thought about doing like in inspecting the current sort of kernel um score adjust? So if it's like a thousand, then or minus a thousand, then you just don't kill it. Uh, so yeah, I mean you can. Uh, people have asked for that in the past. It's like, can you ins please inspect the scores? On the answer is usually like, if you want it, you can write a plugin for it. Uh, I mean we could, but it's like. I don't think it's super necessary given how well PSI works. Um, so one of the rules was that um, do an um kill if the workload slice gets slower than X. Um, how do you manage the CPU usage of the umd if there are a lot of slices and you need to mon monitor a lot of rules? Is there, um, or are you simply, do you only have a few enough uh, slices on the machine that you don't have to worry about it, or are you doing something else? Uh, so is that, are you asking if there's like a perf uh, performance penalty if you just like run UMD on a system with a lot of slices? Like is it just gonna like take a lot of resources on the system? Yes, pretty much, because I assume that UMD has to monitor this all the time to make sure that, okay, I should go and um kill somebody. Yeah, so it monitors it all the time, it pulls every five seconds currently. Uh, so, so for some of the use cases, it's not enough. Five seconds is too slow, and even something like 100 milliseconds is too slow because um, swap can fill up on these fancy new NVMe SSDs super fast, and then like the system just screws itself in like I don't know how many uh, single-digit milliseconds or whatever. And so that's why the um, event interface is so interesting to me because then instead of like um, so I think the proposal is like it's edge triggered, and then once it's edge triggered based on a certain in inc uh, increase in like uh, pressure, then I can pull really fast and not worry about uh, wasting a lot of CPU. But currently, uh, I think I, last time I looked at it, it uses like, over a like, couple days, it uses like a couple milliseconds of CPU time, so it's not that much at all. It just kind of goes through the uh, SysFS and just kind of looks at some files. It's all in memory, so it should be pretty fast. So uh, currently, does it, uh, is, is it monitoring the system level uh, OOM or the, also the C group level OOMs as well? Uh, so it should be able to elide both, although sometimes the C group level ooms are a little more, or depends on how you configure it, but uh, the, the idea is UMD can elide both of them because the C group level, the CG ooms can uh, suffer from the same issues as the uh, host level ooms because things tend to slow down a lot and then kind of stall for a bit and then the CG oom happens. So uh, on the system side, uh, if the system is under oom, so how do you make sure the where the C group or, or the OOMD gets its memory if it is going to trigger and trigger the uh, actual killing of the stuff or whatever, like how yeah. it is granted all the memory allocation that path will success succeed. Uh, yeah, so I, I set memory.min that's to 64 megs and uh, in theory that's, that that's like kind of like a <coughs> it min tells like don't reclaim below this thing, but even if, uh, let's suppose it's even below that, it's uh, on some path it might have to do some uh, allocation. Uh, maybe however you're triggering the OOM or like uh, either in the kernel side, some KMLOG or something like that. Yeah, so th this is a problem I was actually thinking about a while ago. Um, I was told it wouldn't be a problem, and in practice I haven't seen that been a problem. Um, but yeah, in the future you could always do things like you could allocate at the very beginning and just use like, very, like, like a custom allocator or something like that to allocate from a pool. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I haven't seen that been a problem. You can block the memory. Yeah, that's one thing we could do too. Uh, have you started looking at the tail end of the cases that it doesn't cover? So you showed that it, it improved dramatically, but then there's still a tail end case. Do you, do you have any idea what those are? Yeah, so we've, we've been looking at that uh, not, like, not too seriously because we've had a pretty big uh, win already. But uh, we looked at some of the cases. And one of the cases, like I mentioned before, is uh, the really fast SSDs, like just filling up swap really fast. 
And these, some of the other things is like, uh, it, it doesn't handle very fast bursts too well sometimes. For example, if you try to allocate like 100 gigs at once, like some, sometimes it doesn't catch it immediately because again, it pauses every five seconds and it's not just, sometimes you can get a little window you miss. But do, you, do you have anything that, uh, how do you, when you kill a process, uh, does it have to wait for that process to get scheduled again to die, or do you do anything like the Um Reaper does, where it somehow preemptively steals its uh, memory away from it? Because yeah. I, I remember when I was looking at this at some point in time, is the current, the old Um Killer before the Reaper would mark a process as ready to die, and then it needed to wait for it to get scheduled again before the SIG kill could get processed and the thing could actually die. And I don't know, I was wondering if, if you've done something similar to what the Um Reaper did. Uh, I've done nothing fancy. It sends a SIG kill by default. Okay, so it, do, have you noticed that it takes a while to get to the process ever, or is it is it get received pretty quickly? Uh, so I've, we've seen the things before with like, uh, there's a MMPSEM talk earlier today that I really liked, because uh, we did run into an MMPSEM issue, yeah. Because like, uh, I think on the SIG kill path or something, like, uh, I don't know, we tried to do read ahead while uh, holding the MMPSEM lock, and then the IOs would block because the IO submission path needed more memory, and so the whole thing was just deadlock. Um, so yeah, fancy work may be needed, but uh, we have hit some issues. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, does it kill itself? Like UMD itself is uh, immune to being killed, or uh, if it's taking too much memory? Uh, yeah, it's immune to being killed by itself because it doesn't monitor the own, its own slice it runs in. But uh, I suppose the system killer could kill it theoretically. But uh, hopefully that doesn't happen. So did you dis disable uh, kernel ohm killer? Uh, no, we don't disable it. So what if, like, in those five seconds, kernel kills the process? Sorry, could you repeat the last part? Uh, as I understand, you, you pull uh, for the system resources, right, every five seconds? So what if uh, in those five seconds, a uh, kernel kills a process before you could uh, uh, catch it? Uh, yeah, it. that happens sometimes. And the fix for that is, so I have a lot of tunables you can tune for MD, like how fast it kicks in, and like what thresholds it kicks in. Because MD builds like a time series in memory of the memory pressure and does some sort of like very crappy uh, inferences on that. Uh, but yeah, the, the answer to that is like we just, the idea is UMD always kicks in before the kernel killer because the kernel killer is super slow. But in those cases where it doesn't catch it, it's probably worth looking at tuning UMD to catch those cases. Okay. okay. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.